you know, the, there's a preparation for the Nobel Weeks in Stockholm, and they, they often have this uh, ge genius speculating about the future. So we thought we should have some sort of thinker's tank. And, and let me invite some more people to that tank, and that is David Heyman. I hope you're with us. And, uh, and also Erin Sikorsky. And Erin, uh, hi, I can see you now. You are the director of the Center of Climate and Security. That is a part of the Council for Strategic Risks. And David Heyman, you are a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And you also contributed to the, to the report. What would you say about the awareness of these risks that you are uh, dealing with among, among the big uh, audience or, or uh, the public? You know, um, what's a difficulty in all of these events is that at the time they occur, they're very important in the minds of the politicians. But then as time goes on, they begin to forget about these and focus on new issues. There was a really important warning back in 2003 when there was the SARS outbreak, which occurred um, in many countries around the world. Scientists were ready for another event such as this, as Johan said earlier, predicting disease X. However, the politicians were not ready. And so as a result, we were not prepared as we should have been to have resilient health systems, to have populations that are healthy to fight infectious disease, and also good, strong public health to deal with outbreaks when and where they occur. Mm. So we weren't prepared for this. Hopefully this will serve as a lesson in the future, but it's not clear that that will in fact occur. Mm. Maybe I should uh, first uh, ask you, what, what, what are you doing in your daily work uh, when it comes to global catastrophic risks, David? Well, I do a lot of teaching, um, Jens, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I think one of the most impressive um, stories that I can tell to students is about an outbreak in southern Sudan back in 1999, which brings together that animal, human, and ecological, environmental interface that Johan spoke about previously. This was an outbreak of a viral infection called Rift Valley Fever that is carried by ruminant animals, sheep, goats, cattle, and there's a vaccine to prevent infection. But there was a shortage of vaccine back in the 1990s and animals were no longer being vaccinated. And this really fits into what James Reason calls the risk model of Swiss cheese. Because if you want to evaluate risk, you have to figure out what those risks really are. In Swiss cheese model, um, there are um, holes in that Swiss cheese. And if you want to pass an arrow through the Swiss cheese, then you must align four holes. Well, in this outbreak in southern Sudan, the first hole was the fact that ruminant animals were no longer being vaccinated. But then there was an El Nino event in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, which caused flooding in southern Sudan. And flooding forces animals and humans closer together on the dry land and at the same time, the increased water provides breeding places for mosquitoes. Well, mosquitoes are what transmit Rift Valley fever from animals to humans, as does blood of those animals when they're butchered. And so the perfect scenario was set up, holes two and three of the Swiss cheese were the increase in mosquitoes and the, um, the uh, dry land, the closer proximity of animals and humans. Mm. And as a result, there was an outbreak of Rift Valley fever mm. in humans, which was very lethal. That outbreak was rapidly stopped, but the long-term solution, of course, will be better discussions in the climate change discussions to speed up our, um, our mitigation procedures through control of our climates. Right. Erin, what are you up to when it comes to global catastrophic risks? Sure. So what we're looking at at the Center for Climate and Security and the Council on Strategic Risks is the intersection of national security and climate change. Basically, how is climate change shaping 
the national security landscape and touching all of the security risks countries uh, care about and worry about. And I, I think as already has been discussed a bit, we're in a moment of real shift where there's an understanding, right, that we've moved in national security away from just worrying about state actors and the havoc they can wreak on the global stage. Post 9-11, we understood it was non-state actors, it was broader than that, and now there's a greater understanding of the quote-unquote actorless risks, right, whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic or now climate change. But I think we're, the world, I think, is still struggling. You had asked what the, what the public opinion and understanding of the risks are. I think it's still struggling to understand what that means for how we need to shape and change our national security institutions and our approach to tackling these complex problems because it's not climate change alone, right, that is shaping the security landscape. It's climate change intersecting with other risks that already exist. Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of that this summer uh, across the Middle East, for example, where you had uh, drought and uh, lack of water in places like Iran and Iraq and uh, Lebanon, but intersecting with poor management for many years of water and natural resource systems, low trust in government, uh, and it brought people out into the streets to protest against the government and raising risks of instability and, and violence. And you could really pick any part of the world, as you all know well, and find similar dynamics playing out. Uh, so understanding how you can create uh, robust systems, whether it's at the United Nations or within governments or within regional security institutions to better manage and, and understand these risks and, and bring in uh, the, the one great tool I think we have on climate change compared to a lot of other national security uh, risks is that our predictive capabilities mm -hmm. and our modeling and understanding is, is quite good. May, and may so I, how do we... Yeah. No, please, may I ask please, you? Ahead. May I ask you about that, and perhaps start with you one, because I'm a former politician, and if you if you have facts <laughs> on the table, and you can see this is affecting this, it's easier to get legitimacy, and and you can make hard decisions, and and that has been the case, I think, in in COVID-19. But it it is tougher when it is a prediction that that this is what we're going to see, and we know it's hard to predict the weather more than 10 days. So, so to, to what extent is, is the prediction going to give legitimacy to decision making, Yuan? Well, I think Are you asking what we're seeing. Oh, did, did you ask me? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think that this is this is a really interesting question because I think we're seeing a very positive trend line of uh, more and more, you know, what is defined actually as science-based targets for businesses, for cities, uh, guiding policy. We have the whole follow-up of the Paris Climate Agreement based so, so strongly on, you know, translating the political agreement to a global carbon budget, translating that to science-based targets, translating that to mitigation pathways. We know now, I mean, literally this day, we have the start of the Kunming Biodiversity Summit, where there's also discussion of how to scientifically quantify guiding pathways. I think this, this is a, a kind of a, hopefully, a start of an era of having much more measurable, quantified targets at the planetary scale. We've never had that before. I mean, before Paris, we did not even have a 1.5 degree Celsius target, and, and I think this is this is a trend line that we should now start looking for also in, in, in many other sectors, I mean, domains such as in the Global Risk Report. Mm -hmm. uh, may, I, may I ask all of you, we've been, we've been into these questions, but, but this is a question to the panel. David, is, will, it, will it be easy for, for politicians or other decision makers and also the civil society to see this interconnection? Well, I hope it will be, but you know, it's best seen at the local level, at the national level, at the government level. And so solutions are not just good global governance, it's global governments which provides the opportunity for countries to do what they need to do, to do their own risk assessments, their risk analysis, 
and finally their risk mitigation. So it's very important that there be global governance, but also we can't forget that it's time that countries do the job themselves, whether it's detecting and responding to infectious diseases where and when they occur, or whether it's dealing with other things such as carbon emissions or, or food security. Mm. And if we see this complexity, do we, do we see threats in the short run and in the long run? And are there any low-hanging fruits that we can do immediately? Erin. Sure. I mean, I think in terms of, of low-hanging fruit, again, I go back to leveraging the science and some of the predictive capabilities to build trust, uh, say, between countries that have uh, strained relationships and perhaps uh, are in competition with one another. I, I go back to work we did recently on India and China, for example, where you have converging risks of climate change shaping the river basins, the shared river basins, but also two nuclear armed states that uh, have a, a very strained relationship. And if you can leverage opportunities to build a shared scientific understanding, for example, of what's happening to their shared river basins, you have an opening to create um, a better relationship between the two countries on other issues, right? And so I think, uh, as, as David just laid out, you know, having global governance, but then applying it in a local way that parties can really use to, uh, to overcome some of these, these challenges uh, is, is really important. And I think there is opportunity there, especially building that scientific cooperation. It just, it just brings new actors to the table right, mm -hmm. in the security space in a way that can uh, manage and, and lower the temperature sometimes. And so I think building bridges, busting the silos in the governance space between uh, those working on, say, the, the science piece and those working on the security space is, is really important and a really good opportunity. Mm. I, I've received several questions on, on, on the multilateralism, multilateralism and, and other issues that we will come back to. But there was another question that was uh, directed to you, Yuan, and it was a fan, I think, who have listened to you, mm -hmm. but often heard that we have a very short span of time. And, and they have heard that for a long time now. So now they wonder, is the time out? Have we passed it? Well, I would argue that, uh, that the scientific jury is, is out there. Um, I think the mainstream, I would argue that the mainstream in climate science tells us that we still have some room for maneuver, that we have a chance of a soft landing, where we even can stabilize at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. But, you know, the global carbon budget gives us only another 9.5 years of emissions at current levels of emission. If we can really reduce emissions by 6 7% per year, we can make it if all countries in the world land at zero, net zero by 2050. However, it requires maintaining all the other carbon sinks in land, in oceans and on land. So it's a big, a big ask. And, uh, but but I, I would say that it's not too late there, which means that um, it's not too late for the stability of the Earth system. But I think that the, the biggest nervousness is really on, on the biodiversity side, where we have today you know, extinction losses equivalent to a global mass extinction, where we are on path to lose one million of the known eight to nine million species on Earth. I mean, these are lost forever. And we lose ecological functions that are fundamental for, you know, agriculture and food security, for example. So, so these are big risks we're taking. But as things stand now, I think you, you one can conclude that we still have this, this ability to keep at least the environmental resilience reasonably at a manageable level. Mm. And, and we have one question to the panel for all of you. Do we have a, 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 a setup where we can solve this, this complexity? You talked about the global level, uh, the local level, David. We have a local, national, regional, global level. Can you explore a little bit about the possible solutions for such a complex risk scenario? Well, you know, uh, Jens, every, every country in the world has agreed to a set of standards for public health. 
And these are embedded in what's called the International Health Regulations, which are a treaty. And these are required interventions that countries would have in order that they can detect and respond to disease where and when it occurs. So there are some frameworks works there, but the problem is that when a country does an assessment and decides what it needs, many times the bilateral support that they obtain with matching funds, of course, from their own countries is not there. And at the same time, many times there's not in government engagement to really implement the plans that they develop after they've done their assessments on these public health capacities under the international health regulations. So even though there are tools that exist or frameworks that exist, governance if you would, they're not always being followed because the donor community doesn't provide the support that's necessary and the countries themselves don't demand that support and don't match it with their own contributions. So we, we need to motivate countries to do the job. It's not just enough to push it from the top down. It must come from the bottom up from governments demanding mm -hmm. that they have the tools necessary. Yeah. Erin, I think your, your, some of your colleagues wrote uh, one chapter in our risk reports about the complexity mm -hmm. and how to handle it. What, what are your thoughts about how the society can handle this complexity because we are often organized more in in silos exactly exactly and i think uh the the challenge is to break down those silos and find opportunities for cross-sectoral interdisciplinary conversations about how to tackle these risks and you know with the support of the the global challenges foundation a few years ago we released a responsibility to prepare and prevent which was a framework for tackling climate security at the global governance level and designed to come up with mechanisms for breaking down those silos and bringing different actors to the table as i as i mentioned before i think one powerful tool can be tabletop exercises and scenarios analysis where you really get these uh, policymakers out of their day to day and thinking through how these complex risks will play out on on the world stage, and and that can that can really help. Uh, but they need they need the opportunity to do that, and they need, as I think David said, the bottom up pressure to do that as well. You say on the on the governance side when it comes to this complexity of risks. Did you did you hear me, oh. Johan? Uh, do we have a, no, sorry, a, no, do we have a, a governance that is suited for for this complexity of risks that that we describe? No, I, I think I think we have to. I, I think we have to conclude that we do not. I mean, I think David has a has a fundamental point here that the solution lies in in kind of cross scale interactions and really recognizing that. The action is on the ground, the complexity is on the ground. The trouble or the challenge for us is that it's so interconnected across health, across food, across energy, across impacts related to global environmental change that this can be abrupt, that we even have to now redefine the global commons, not only to think of this as being you know, the high seas or Antarctic or outer space, but all the systems that regulates the stability of the planet. So suddenly we have no choice but to have you know collaborations across scales and, and and get it kind of tied together at the global level and there's no appetite for that today the only place there is a sliver of appetite is of course on trying to avoid conflict and and i think that is perhaps the, the most constructive entry point to see that that security climate and security health and security uh, conflict and security those kind of threats uh, are, are kind of uh, let's say surfacing up at the global governance level, but but otherwise I think we are still in a quite piecemeal, hierarchical, segmented mode of governance. So I think the New Shape Forum has a, has a lot to talk about. Yes, and tomorrow I mean we're going to talk about other possible uh, uh, institutions that could deal with these kind of matters. I mean we have the. The Security Council, but the Security Council is concentrated on on uh, armed conflicts and doesn't want to handle too much with 
with climate or uh, biological collapse so we, we will discuss that tomorrow but I, I've got the question and that is a little bit related to the the chapter in our report and it, it says why keep up the multilateralism approach instead of multi-stakeholder approach to bring other actors NGOs businesses and and to negotiate around the new table Erin Oh, I think absolutely a multi-stakeholder approach is is critical for all the reasons we have discussed and David has pointed out. Um, you need the actors on the ground, you need sub-state actors involved, you need transnational actors involved. And if it's only states discussing these issues, you're not going to get to the right right answer. So so coming up with approaches that that bring in different stakeholders is is absolutely critical. I agree. Uh, another another suggestion is that to develop scenarios so that we can practice. David. Yes, Aaron referred to scenarios earlier, and it's clearly important that they be developed. And coming back to the question you asked, Aaron, just recently, I think it would be useful in those scenarios to include the private sector. You know, the UN system and and many in general avoid contact with the private sector, uh, hoping there won't be any perceived conflict of interest or conflict of interest. But what's important is for everyone to work together in the future. If you think back to the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, the mining companies which were in the countries where these outbreaks occurred just pulled out of the countries when the outbreaks occurred. Had they been prepared with the scenario within the country, Provide platforms, for example, during an outbreak, it might be that they could have stayed there and contributed to the response to the outbreak rather than just pulling out. So we need to be more inclusive around the table in our scenarios as we prepare for the future. Mm. Yes, you want. Uh, now we are getting closer to to the COP twenty six as well. And what, what are your expectations there? And, and can a COP26 also encounter other risks that are in this complex? Yes, well, as you know, <laughs> the expectations on COP26 are, are, you know, I was just about to say huge. I mean, they're very large. And that is not surprising. I mean, with the scientific advancements since Paris, we know that 1.5 is a real biophysical boundary. We also know that the country's NDCs plans, the nationally determined contributions so far, take us to 2.7 degrees Celsius, which is a catastrophic risk. So all the countries must now really align the national plans with science. But the most exciting, um, you know, kind of development on the table for, for COP26 apart from all the technicalities and all the money on the table and all the negotiations that have gone, is that the UK government has really set out as an objective to connect the climate agenda with the nature agenda. And that is, of course, also a way of connecting to, I would argue, global catastrophic risks. Because if we continue undermining the carbon sinks and the resilience in the living biosphere, we won't deliver on Paris and we will have the hit back on societies through global systemic risks. So I have big expectations on Glasgow to be the first nature climate COP. And, and who knows, that could take us to a level where we start really recognizing that the climate, you know, we will never resolve the climate crisis unless we connect it with the health agenda, as David has pointed out, um, with, with all the other sectors that are so fundamental to, to this stability of the climate system. So, you know, there is... Um, there's reason to, to have big expectations on Glasgow. Will it succeed? Well, so far we don't have the global governance indications that it will because too many countries are still sitting on the fence. It's actually only the China, the US and the European Union that has at least attempted to pledge net zero targets. Too late for China, late as 2060, but at least trying to, and the European Union and the US for 2050. So you see, there's still an enormous, you know, we're, we're, we're still on an uphill road here. You, uh, when talking to you, I can see that you are. It's it's not a debate on how it is. You're you're saying 
approximately the same thing and, and a, a little bit also when it when it comes to the needs that we need to take all stakeholders to the table. But is there also a resistance out there? Is there people that are against what you are saying or denying it? I, I just would like to know that. Erin. Uh I, I can I can jump in, I you know, and this is coming from the U.S. perspective. I I, I do think there are those, if if not denying it, they are, it, they they still are in this rack and stack mode, right? You know, there's going to be number one risk, and then there's others below it, and they don't all intersect. And you see this a lot when it comes to discussion of competition with China, for example, and that you don't want to bring climate change into that that conversation. So I think. The, the real challenge is is just the modes of thinking about national security and and getting folks to a place where they can think about systemic risk. Um, it's not that they don't they think we're wrong necessarily, but it's just it's a new way of approaching the problem uh, that's frankly different uh, than all our institutions are set up to deal with and and manage. And it's really hard to break out of that institutional framework sometimes. So I think that. That is the big challenge: is is culture and and ways of thinking about these problems um, and mainstreaming that across the national security and security community writ large. David, do you have to spend a lot of time with deniers or or other people that are resisting your theories and, and knowledge? Well, there certainly are deniers, as we've seen, and in, including in today in the anti-vaccination. There are people who recommend not to be vaccinated with no real evidence as to why they're recommending that. It's just a principle with them that they want to recommend non-vaccination. And this is this is this is carries over into many parts of, of society, in fact, where there's denial about many different things. And even among political leaders to a certain extent, who are focused on short-term gains, not on the long-term gains. And so what you see is that a politician might be denying the fact that they have to invest in public health because they can invest in an emergency um, department and see that the people who could have been prevented from having illness in, in public health are being taken care of. The short-term goal is satisfying the present need. The long-term goal, public health, is just not within their realm of understanding many times because it doesn't give them the benefit they need in the short term for the next election or the next process coming forward. Mm -hmm. Johan, do you need to spend a lot of time with with the Nyers or people that are resisting your thoughts and forecasts? Of course, there are, just, just like Aaron and David points out, there are deniers out there. There are also skeptics. Um, but I, I see that to be less and less of, of a challenge on, on at least on, on climate and, and the reason for that are multiple i mean apart from this the fact that, that the science is so unequivocally settled but also that we see that the solutions to solve the climate crisis have better competitive outcomes you know even on on very basic grounds on jobs economy uh, advancements of society basic health and uh, and that in itself i think also is unleashing or kind of liberating us from, from large parts of this discussion. But of course, it differs yeah. from different parts of the world. I think we in Europe are, are much less yeah. affected that, for example, than in the US. So we, we spend very little time on, on denialism, to be honest. That said, there is, of course, skepticism on global governance in general, that this belief that global governance means global government, that this kind of erroneous connection point there that you cannot have global governance on democratic grounds. And I think that that's a, that's a another stumbling block to, to handle as well. Mm -hmm. But do you do you think that, and this is the question, do you think that, that we can create some sort of global sovereignty at the global level that is acceptable for, for nations, that, that you can find some institution that, that you would give your sovereignty if it is only connected to these global catastrophic risks? Erin. Well, to, to, to some extent, I mean, that, that's, I find that quite interesting that when it comes to, to trade agreements, when it comes to uh, financial transactions, when it comes to certain parts of armed conflict, we have done that already. 
I mean, we, we have that in inbuilt in the global governance system. So it shouldn't be so far away to be able to do it also in global catastrophic risks. The question is how to do it in a transparent, democratic way, in a way that really um, creates a, a sense of, of trust from, from all actors. Mm. Erin, do you? Yeah, I, I would agree that trust is, is key. And I think uh, being able to demonstrate uh, the benefits right of of such a framework and and such a need to to perhaps give up some some sovereignty but as as mentioned these already exist in other areas and we accept uh uh them because we see the benefits and we recognize that we can't tackle the issue alone um that we're actually safer together working towards managing these risks and so i think the same is true here but but trust and and managing uh, myths and disinformation, I think, is also quite critical. Uh, finding ways to communicate about these risks in such a way that that galvanizes action and isn't um, that defends against the misinformation that exists around them as well. Because I think there is uh, a tendency we must push against to to turn inward. Right, that countries say, "Well, I, we're going to manage this on our own. We're going to shut off our borders. We're going to um, just take care of ourselves." And we have to find ways to break through that mentality and show that a) it's not possible <laughs> to do that in the long run, and and b) that we'll all benefit more um, by by coming together. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a tall order for sure, but I think doable. And what do you say, David Heyman? Is has COVID-19 give us any, uh, any more, what would you say, uh, trust in such, such a global sovereign decision making? You know, I think that this pandemic has not yet done that. Um, what did happen after the SARS pandemic, or epidemic rather, in 2003 is that countries began to work together more closely in various things, and they developed, for example, a pandemic influenza preparedness framework, which is a guarantee that developing countries or lower in, and middle income countries will have access to a certain amount of pandemic vaccine should there be a flu pandemic. So there has been a willingness to work together, but to give up sovereignty has been very difficult for countries. You know, the closest thing, I think, to, to giving up sovereignty is when a country signs a treaty such as the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. By signing up to that and developing legislation within their own countries, they are, to a certain extent, unifying their activities with others around the world. But whether or not they're actually giving up their sovereignty to do that, I can't say for sure, but I don't believe they are. Okay, thank you very much. We are we are going to talk. About, I don't know what we're going to talk about in the next session because it's unknown risks, but I think that could be exciting. And then we're going to talk to Martin Rees, and I I, I know that some of you will stay after his presentation to to see how we can cope with unknown risks. But until now, thank you very much. And now we're going to have a 15 minute break. So a 15 minute break for now for coffee for those who want or tea. Uh, and then we'll see each other here again. And also thank you for